Turtles. Why did it have to be turtles? Twitchy Dolphin Media presents Let's Get To and the Tortugas de Daytona. Oh, it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old bar. Take me out to Twitchy Dolphin Media presents Let's Get To. It's baseball from sea to shining sea by the team that brings you home. And now your host, James Christopher. And welcome to the show. I am your host, James Christopher. We have a great show for you today. Look, guys, we're about 25 days away from the Round Rock Express's first theme night of the season, Austin Black Senators Night, celebrating the impact of the Negro Leagues on baseball. It also means we're about 25 days away from the first person to complain about a theme night in 2023. Yay. A few years ago, I challenged Astros beat writer Chandler Rome on Twitter about his disdain and therefore, in my opinion, lack of understanding theme nights. His solution was to block me. And very few people have actually blocked me on Twitter because, listen, I'm a delight. I'm a peach. Just ask my wife. For those who don't know, theme nights exist across the spectrum. There are historical ones like the Nine Nights celebrating the Negro Leagues. We have pop culture nights like Star Wars Night, Wizarding Night, and for some reason that third rail of pop culture, Princess Night. We have community nights like Pride Night and Faith and Family Nights all over the place. And all of these are designed to help bring new fans to the ballpark. That's it. New fans to come to a game that's losing younger fans. That might, in fact, be a good idea to help keep ballplayers, teams, and even joyless beat writers employed. Now, these nights should inspire one of two reactions. The first being, yay, this will be fun. Or the second, you know, not for me, but I'll go to the game and ignore it, or I'll just go another night. But instead, in very modern-day fashion, they inspire anger and rage, Almost as much as a new Disney trailer, am I right? You can set a clock by the month of June. The first Pride-inspired logo will ignite the rage of a thousand intolerant sons. Faith and Family Night will bring sarcastic mockery. Princess Night brings out a certain level of misogyny towards young girls that I'm really not comfortable with. But there are simple ways to deal with a theme night you don't like. One, don't go. There are other nights for you, and we have streaming services now. Take a night off. Or two, go and ignore it. All right, everybody out there, are you not gay? Are you still living in the 50s and think homosexuality is some pathway to hell? First, get a life. Second, realize that if you go to a Pride Night game, you don't have to make out with another dude or another chick. There's not like recruitment booths or they're not trying to indoctrinate you. The reality is, and I know this will shock some of you, gay people are people who likes sports. We'll talk a lot more about baseball and pride in June, but the reality is this. And if you're watching this show, it's because you care about baseball or you think I'm super handsome. The game, it's at risk. The average age of the fan is only getting older. They're changing the rules of the game drastically to try to appeal to young people. Rules that a lot of us like myself aren't super thrilled about. And the solution is maybe just as simple as getting people into the ballpark. Take Princess Knight. A mom or dad brings his daughter to the game. Now she's there to meet Belle or Princess Elsa, and during the game, she gets to sit down with mom and dad to learn a little bit about baseball. You see, baseball is beautiful, and the way to save baseball might just be as simple as getting people in the door and letting the game take care of itself. Okay, off the soapbox for now. We've got our friends, the Daytona Tortugas, on the show, And we're going to talk to some folks that are going to help us learn how we can save some actual sea turtles. So stay with us. On the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' names? Yes. 
Well, then who's playing first? Yeah. I mean, the fellows. Who's on play. first? Whoa. The Let's the Get To first team first of the week. Whoa. All right, we're excited to welcome to Let's Get To Justin Rock. He's the voice of your Daytona Tortugas. Justin, great to have you back on the show, man. How's it going? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the off season is almost over. The long national nightmare, to quote was it Gerald Ford. Uh, how was your off season as you guys get ready to kind of jump into another year of Tortuga baseball? Uh, everything's going great, actually. Right now, I'm still up uh, home in uh, in New Jersey, working at Army West Point, doing their women's basketball games. Cool. I just got back from uh, Boston University uh, at the crack of uh, of dawn, basically last night uh, after after a tough road loss. But season's going well. Everything's going well up here up north. And once uh, once our season wraps up here uh, in, in New York, uh, I'll uh, pack up the uh, pack up the car and. Trek on down to Daytona Beach for another fantastic baseball season down in Florida. How many of you guys have to do that kind of uh, do other broadcasting gigs in the in the off season? Is that pretty common? Uh, I feel like it varies from uh, from place to place. There's some teams that have broadcasters that are on full time uh, that, you know, uh, do some maybe some sales stuff and other things like that. Uh, with the organization during uh, during the off season, uh, but there are others out there that are, are like myself that are more of a, a seasonal position where they're working for the team during you know during the minor league season, and then once the season is over, it gives the minor league team a little bit of reprieve, not you know having to pay an extra person on salary. Um, and also gives the broadcasters some extra free reign to take on some extra uh, freelance roles or whatever other broadcasting opportunities may be available to them uh, during, you know, the basketball and collegiate sports seasons. Very cool. And so you're working for Army now. That's pretty neat. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's an amazing experience. Uh, this is my seventh or eighth season now. Uh, working for Army West Point women's basketball. I do some other various sports, fill in for the men's basketball games and their football conflicts uh, during the fall season. And uh, it, it's just been an amazing experience uh, being there. I, I've said it on air in Daytona broadcasts and really uh, wherever I've been since I've worked at Army. If uh, if you get a chance, if you love history and you love you know scenery uh, in the United States, um, I highly recommend not only going to visit West Point, but Annapolis and Colorado Springs, where the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy are as well. I mean, they are just three of the most beautiful uh, locations. You know, those two in West Point, uh, this country has to offer not alone the uh, the history that those uh, three locations offer. So it, it's been amazing from a historical uh, context because I was a history minor as well, um, but also just. Uh, um, you know, as as a human being, getting to 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 meet and interact with uh, you know future soldiers and current soldiers and retired uh, soldiers, um, just an amazing, amazing people from all different walks of life, uh, and really, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there in the world and in the country uh, right now. But uh, being being around those people at Army and Navy and Air Force, uh, you know, gives gives you a, a nice uh, you know whiff of, of confidence uh, of the people who are uh, in, in leadership positions going forward in this country. And as, of course, my responsibility as a former non-commissioned officer in the Army is to say that the Air Force is barely the military. Anyway, uh, we're <laughs> on to that. Hey, I'm, I'm used to hearing it at West Point all the time. I'm, I'm yeah, used to hearing okay, it there you go. The yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we jump into this season's Daytona thing, I'm curious because um, – you noticed my polo Cape Cod league. You had mentioned that you worked at the Cape Cod league and I'm trying to tell everybody I can that if you like baseball, you know, I, I we went to the Cape Cod this league this year, the game before it was at a smaller collegiate summer league. Look, I love all lower levels of baseball, but there is a difference at the Cape Cod league. Like at the Cape Cod league is university of Texas at the other league. It's the university of Texas at Arlington. Explain a little bit about just what the Cape Cod league is like. The Cape League is, you know, some of the best experiences I've had, not only uh, as a broadcaster, but, you know, just as a, when I was a college student and in general, I had, a you know, an incredible privilege uh, to work for the Born Braves uh, in the summers of 2012 and, and 2013 uh, as a broadcast intern working with uh, some amazing, amazing people, some amazing, amazing players. And, you know, this is all in, in the Cape Cod League, you know, nonprofit, you know, the people that are running these organizations you know, they have real full time jobs. You know, I remember, you know, our president was a lawyer, you know, yeah. the person who was in charge of our interns, you know, was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a, 
person that was working for a bank um, and things like that. You know, these are people that are actively involved in their community way more than baseball. And the games are free. Anything you pay to go to a game is a donation to help keep the team, you know, running and afloat. And, uh, you know, you are literally sitting, you know, right on top of the action for, you know, some of the best baseball players in the country. Some of them you've heard of that you've, you know, you've seen on ESPN in the College World Series. And a lot of times the players that make the biggest noise in the Cape League are guys from smaller schools that you never heard of that turn themselves from, you know, uh, you know, day two or day three picks into a first round draft pick. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's just an amazing experience, you know, so close to the action and, uh, get to interact with the players, um, as well from, from a really close perspective. It's there, there is very few, uh, baseball experiences out there quite like the Cape Cod baseball league. I mean, there are a ton of great summer collegiate leagues sure. out there, but, and, you know, but there's, there's just something, you know, different, uh, you know, with how the Cape league is run that, you know. Um, g- gives it a little special, um, you know, almost like a, a high school, um, you know, almost, you know, rec, you know, baseball summer league, you know, kind of, uh, kind of vibe, whereas, you yeah. know, you, 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 you know, you're choosing up sides and going out and playing. Yeah. And, you know, and of course there's always going to be a pecking order of talent. That's how things work. And it just, it filters, you know, and again, I'm very big fan of Northwoods league. I'm very big fan of of you know, I'm going to the Alaska baseball league this summer. So that's, yeah. that should be awesome. I, I've, I've heard great things. Very excited. You know, I went to see you in last summer and that was a different experience temperature than I think I'm going to experience in <laughs> Alaska. Although I did have one of the best pizzas of my life in Daytona, the only benefit to the rain out. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about your season coming up, but I want to give you a compliment. It's one I gave you guys as I was leaving. Um, I had an amazing time in Daytona and the game was rained out. I thought it was so cool to see the number of y'all's fans who hung around for the possibility that the game could still get made. Um, even then, you know, talking to the young professor, even then, like the environment, it was palpable how much the town must love that team because I could feel it in a game that wasn't even played. Yeah, no, that has been uh, one of the things that has kept drawing me back to Daytona year after year has been the passion, not only for the Tortugas, but just the game of baseball and the history uh, of baseball within that city and the history of so many things uh, in that city. I mean, one of my favorite things working for the Tortugas is not only the people that will come up to me at the ballpark and, and tell me about stories of you know, when they were the the Daytona Beach Astros or the Daytona Beach Islanders long before the, the Cubs or, or the Reds, Tortugas uh, ever came to town. Um, but also, you know, our office building across the street has been around for as long um, as Jackie Robinson, you know, when he was playing at, at the, you know, the ballpark that now bears his name in 1946. I mean, there's a photo of our ballpark where you could see over his and Rachel Robinson's shoulder the building where our offices are right now and the amount of people that will come in and out of our office and tell us, uh, you know, different things that our building used to be. Uh, the Allman brothers played there before the <laughs> Allman brothers, or the Allman brothers uh, because they're from the Daytona beach area, things like that. You know um, th- there's a lot of history w- w- within that, you know, city Island neighborhood um, in Daytona beach. And it's, it's just an incredible pleasure to be able to, to tell that story every day. And uh, our, our fans are a big reason why we're able to tell that story because uh, they keep uh, they keep filling the seats and and keeping us around year after year and uh, make it fun year after year. Again, I yeah, I totally. I mean, I totally get it. I even talked to a couple of old timers again while we were out there. Again, no game happening, and it still felt like one of the best baseball experiences I had of the year. Um, I, I also had uh, Dan Simon on the show you know, the creator of the look of the, the, the Tortugas. And he's so proud of what he's done with you guys. And I think he has a right to be. It's one of the best looking Absolutely. teams in minor league baseball. Absolutely. I mean, I I never uh, take for granted an opportunity to brag about our uh, our logos, our uniforms, our, our color schemes. I mean, look, the proof is in the pudding uh, to, to steal a cliche uh, there. You know, I mean, every time we post on our website or on our team store, either off season during the season about new merchandise, whether it be t-shirts, especially 
our our caps are on either on field caps, um, off field caps, whether they're fitted or, or or just you know Velcro, whatever whatever style it is. I mean, we sell out of them, and you know it feels like in a hot minute we're ordering, having to. So, you know, go back to our, our suppliers and, and order more. So um, the fact that people keep wanting to uh, to uh, to to buy into Tortuga's gear and that uh, so many people love to rock it that uh, aren't even in the Daytona Beach area yeah. is, uh, is a really, really, really uh, cool feeling to have and to have that kind of branding. And uh, um, as a baseball fan, I just love, you know, how it also translates to our, our on field look. Um, with our uniforms, they're they're absolutely beautiful, and it leads us to some great um, alternate and, and specialty options as well. And and yeah. uh, it, it just, it's just great stuff. And uh, we 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 thank him for uh, for his great <laughs> his great contributions and help giving us uh, a, such a recognizable and uh, um, honestly just beautiful uh, beautiful look. Yeah, for you from like I think I have my minor league collection. I have more ho- hooks. Uh, sea wolves and you guys and anybody else like it's all multiple things for you guys and then one or two, onesies or twosies and um real quick before we have a little fun with a little rapid fire stuff give me a broad overview of what we can expect at the ballpark this year for 2023 well there's going to talk about you know logo stuff there's been a lot of talk one of the cool things is marvel defenders the diamond mm-hmm. released, uh our new marvelized logo we're going to have some specialized nights with that specialty on field caps with that logo that uh will be for sale as well, uh, and we'll also have specialty on-field uniforms that go along with that. That's going to be great. Uh, Jackie Robinson Day, we're going to be home uh, this year oh, in cool. Daytona Beach, which is fantastic. Uh, big thanks to to everyone at Major League Baseball for helping make sure that became a possibility, uh, taking on the Palm Beach Cardinals. So really, really excited to be home um, for that day. Um, considering the history of our ballpark and our, and our namesake. Um, so that's going to be fantastic. And so many other different, you know, specialty nights uh, along those lines, uh, you know, like Marvel, um, you know, different bobbleheads will always have, uh, you know, uh, you know, a player will, will have a Sheldon bobblehead uh, coming out as well. I'm sure we'll have something different uh, this year, as I know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident the, uh, the, the Bob Ross night uh, has been retired uh, at least uh momentarily yeah um, i'm sure it'll, it'll work its way back into the rotation because it's too popular not to um and then the movie's but, uh, coming out so you gotta you know it, it, exactly so you know you know, the, to, you know it, it we will we, we will bide our time for the for the right moment but uh we'll, we'll have a lot of different uh you know, fun things like that, but our daily promotions will will remain the same with all the great stuff that we have going on at the ballpark. You know, every night, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Thursday, Thursdays are always going to be back. Fireworks um, on, on select Friday nights, so it's it's going to be great stuff. But the big thing, uh, honestly, this year, one of the big changes in Daytona this year is our start times are being pushed up a little bit. Um, okay, on weekday nights, or we'll be starting at six thirty-five instead of seven oh five, and on Sundays we'll start at five o'clock instead of uh, five thirty-five. Um, so you know, Daytona Beach fans and fans that are coming into Daytona. You know, make sure to uh, to make a note of that. We'll be starting a little bit earlier this year and, uh, you know, will be hopefully a benefit to not only uh, our fans, especially our younger fans uh, on school nights for them to get home maybe a little bit earlier. Um, but I- I'm sure also uh, our-, our players uh, and staff will also uh, not complain about getting out. Uh, hopefully it may be a little bit earlier as well yeah. and get home for families too. When you're talking about humidity, it doesn't matter if it's 630 or 705, but getting home – Earlier is important. All right, look, we have five new rapid fire questions. One of the popular demands was that I change these up from last year. So um, we have some that are cultivated for just you and John Costas from the Columbia Fireflies. And then after this, this set goes away. Um, are you ready? I, I am ready. Let it fly. All right. What is your favorite part about the off season? Favorite part about the off season, honestly, it's been working at uh, working at West Point. Like I said, I've, I've got an opportunity to work with some amazing, um, amazing people, and you know, getting to to spend some time with my uh, my friends and family. You know, uh, you know how it is during the baseball minor league season. We're we're you know right in the thick of it. You know, day in day out, even on off days, we're doing some sort of work. Um, so to get some time to reconnect with friends and family and uh, recharge the batteries to get excited again for another, you know, amazing season ahead. Um, you know, th- th- those are the best parts of the off season. Okay. When you're visiting a city, like for me, it's pizza. 
What is your go-to food that helps you define the town? That is a fantastic question. I feel like sometimes it varies for me on where I am. I always try and find some sort of mom and pop place. That is, you know, first, that's the most important thing for me, uh, especially traveling in minor league baseball. You know, you sometimes see a lot of different chain restaurants that you end up eating at with your yeah. teammates and 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 your, your coworkers and things like that. Uh, so anytime I can find uh, any sort of mom and pop place, doesn't have to be a specific kind of cuisine like pizza or barbecue or anything like that, but just something that's, you know, you know, you know, homegrown, homemade, you know, I can clear water. It's a place called Lenny's that's right around from where our, our team hotel is um, and things like that. So I, I always love doing that on the road. Okay. And again, one of my favorite pizzas I've ever had was in Daytona. So there you go. All right. Godfather one or two. I am. I'm going to date myself and, you know, put myself in a precarious body. I have not seen either of the the Godfather movies yet. I am. And I have been ridiculed my friends many, many times. I am terrible um, <laughs> at, 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 at seeing seeing films. I think part of that is is my uh, is is my sports schedule. Um, but uh, I think even my father and mother have uh, have chastised me on that one. So I, I need to to sit down and uh, make sure I watch uh, some key parts of, of cinematic history. We're going to uh, have you on. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure my I'm sure my girlfriend will make sure that happens yeah. in the coming Let's months. Say, we're going to have you on again in about one year. Um, let's make sure it's happened by then. That's what we're going to do. We're going to follow up with you when it, whenever it's over. You All got right, it. Um, I can guess by what's on your head, but are you a dad hat guy, a flex fit guy, or a fitted hat guy? I've always been more of a fitted hat guy, but I feel like, I guess, I guess maybe it's a natural progression as you get older that like you just, you you start getting more into maybe some of the, the, the dad hat and flex fit hats, yeah. stuff like that. Now I've, I've got a Tortugas, you know, uh, you know, more of a, maybe like a, a snapback, you know, Velcro kind of hat style that I, you know, I have my, you know, my girlfriend gave me a, a hat from something she works with uh, and I rock that all the time. That's more of a, you know, a Velcro, you know, flex fit kind of hat, but uh, I've historically always been more of a, more of a, a fitted hat guy. Okay. Last one. Um, over the last few years, there have been some new rules in, uh, introduced in Major League Baseball from really from 2020 on. Um, which of these rules do you think needs to go? And then which one do you think will be good for the game? I'm very excited this year to see what happens with the implementation of the pitch clock. I think it's been a huge benefit in minor league baseball. I know there are a lot of people who are very skeptical about that whether that be fans or the players themselves. Um, but you've seen your fair share of minor league games mm -hmm. um, after, you know, really the, the first maybe month or so, it, it really became a, a borderline non-issue. Um, so I really think that's going to be the case. And it's going to be a talking point April, you know, May, especially during spring training when the games start up this coming weekend. Um, but by the time we get to June and the all-star break, I really don't think it's going to be. Yeah. A major, a major, major issue. And as for one that I think needs to go, I don't think it needs to go. I think it probably needs to be modified a little bit, probably to uh, appease more fans. And that is the extra inning rule. Um, more so in the sense, not, not getting rid of it entirely, but maybe pushing it back a couple of extra innings. I know a lot of my friends, whether they be my contemporaries in my age or, you know, a little bit older, like my dad and his contemporaries, you know, it's not that they have necessarily an issue with it is that it's too soon, you know, being in the, in the 10th inning, maybe push it toward more towards the 12th or 13th when, you know, you know, you're trying to prevent it from going all night, um, but yeah. still also having, you know, some chance to, to to end the game in, you know, maybe the 10th or 11th um, in a more natural uh, baseball setting, which I think is a fair compromise uh, to both ends, especially at the major league level where you're more able to, you know, interchange your rosters and you're really able to at, you know, the, the single A and double A level in the minors. Right, exactly. Well, Justin... Uh, again, we're going to be following you guys. I'll have all the links down here so people can get all their sweet, sweet Daytona Tortugas merch. But thanks so much for jumping on Let's Get To and good luck in the 2023 season. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon, my friend. Always happy to have you down in Daytona Beach. This 
seventh inning stretch. What's going on outside of the ballpark? So before we jump into this amazing interview, I wanted to explain a little bit about the segment you're about to watch, the seventh inning stretch. So the core of our show is about the culture of the game of baseball and the communities that support their teams. These towns influence the teams while the teams influence the town. And it's a great synergy that allows you to learn a little bit about this country while talking about the greatest game ever invented. So in our regular segments for the seventh inning stretch, we're going to find something else to do in the town that the team is in. That way, when you make your trip to see, for example, the Daytona Tortugas, you might pop in and tour the racetrack, or you might go to a really good pizza place. The idea being that in most cases, you'll learn about the team, and then when you take your trip, you'll have something else to do. Now, sometimes we might find a different angle that connects to our team. And for example, today... We spoke to the Daytona Tortugas, and in that spirit, we're reaching out and interviewing a sea turtle rescue. They're going to talk to us about what they do to help keep these animals around and what we can do to help them. It's a very worthwhile cause, so enjoy the interview. So we are excited as we continue to talk a little Tortugas to talk about the people that are help saving the sea turtles. We've got Wendy Knight from the South Padre Island Sea Turtle Rescue. First of all, Wendy, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's a beautiful day on South Padre Island. Is it ever not really a uh, a beautiful day on South Padre Island, though? It's tough to complain. <laughs> it's it's tough to complain. So you guys are Sea Turtle Incorporated. You guys are help saving the sea turtles. Let's talk a little bit about just first of all. You know, it's interesting because I'm of the age where I remember when a lot of these um, initiatives started. The idea of conservation. Um, And now we're seeing it take effect. There's stories about why the great whites are back, right? Because the seals are back and stuff like that. A little bit of history about the the organization and why people felt it was important to rehabilitate and save this particular species of turtle. Well, great. Yeah, you actually just hit the nail on the head. Um, This organization was created 45 years ago um, by a woman, uh, Isla Fox Letcher, that kind of saw exactly what you just described. Sea turtles, along with some other um, species, were added to the endangered species list. Uh, all seven species of sea turtles are either near extinction or critically critically extinct, uh, near extinction. And she just kind of got tired of waiting on someone else to do it. Um, so she did. Um, and uh, she started it really literally in her backyard here in South Padre Island. Uh, right off Gulf Boulevard facing the ocean. And, um, you know, Isla was a bit of a a maverick. Um, So she was part of the original 99ers, first 99 women with a pilot's license. She was buddies with Amelia Amelia Earhart um, and was not afraid to do hard things. Uh, And that kind of that spirit of scrappy, you know, get it done uh, still exists with us today, 45 years later. So we're not in the back of Isla's backyard um, anymore. Uh, But that spirit of just doing what needs to get done for an animal that can't help itself uh, still very much permeates the organization today. Um, And what I love when you go to the website, and we'll have the link in the description of this episode, but it really breaks down kind of the way you view this. There's sort of a three-pronged approach to this. And I want to talk about the education piece first because – you know, After the movie Blackfish came out, there was all this push to, to sort of get rid of zoos and such. A lot of people were making the argument that we only care because those things exist. How important is it to teach kids who don't see one of these things every day that um, that they need to be protected? Yeah. So, you know, I tell people all the time, education is our proactive approach. You know, I have a full hospital. Um, full of patients all year round. That's our reactive approach. That's that's just us bobbing and weaving, trying to solve problems. Education is the way that we change the future. It's our proactive approach. Um, and in our facility, we have what's called a residence center. And our residence center is full of education animals. So these are sea turtles that for one reason or another will never survive outside of residency in our facility. Um, And for a sea turtle, what that usually means is they can't do what sea turtles have to do, which is dive down to the bottom to get food or dive up to the top to get air or some semblance of both of those things. Right. Um, So our resident turtles are, to your point, a critical part of really making the dots connect 
you get to see 350,000 gallons of water and hundreds of years worth of sea turtles and thousands of pounds of them uh, in their semi-natural habitat. They're in the water with other fish. They're near corals and seagrass. And, you know, you get to experience that it starts to make those connections. So, you know, when we send people out of here, I tell people my two goals is I want them to know two things, whether you're in a landlocked city or on a beachfront city, I want you to leave here knowing that if you will pick up five pieces of trash every time you leave your house and right. put it in the trash can, or if you'll eliminate one single use plastic out of your life, like you can move the needle. We have a quarter of a million people a year come in this facility. If I have a quarter of a million people move to pick up five pieces of trash a day, 365 days a year, like we're moving the needle. And that's, that's all because of that education piece. And you talked a little bit about the rehab piece. So I'm I'm interested in this too, because as a child, there was a dream of being a marine biologist. At one point, <laughs> I went into independent film because I couldn't do math. Um, here we are. But you guys, so that's a big part of it. And like you said, the reactive part of that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how that works. Is it somebody finds a turtle and brings it to you? Do you go looking for them? And then how do you make the determination that, yes, this turtle can be reintroduced to the wild or this one can't? Yeah. So um, it is our primary goal is rehabilitation and release. That is uh, by far, it is the norm and being deemed non-releasable is the far reaching exception. Um, so a, a great example, most sea turtles can live without one of their flippers. That doesn't oh. mean they don't have to, that doesn't mean they can't survive. They absolutely can be adaptive. Um, just like any other animal. We patrol more than 10,000 miles a year um, our staff does um, uh, up and down on more than 50 miles of beach between South Padre Island and Boca Chica Beach. Um, a, a lot of our patients are found in those patrols. Uh, and then a very large portion is found by good people um, that are here on a vacation and see a sea turtle in need or hurt and call our 24 hour hotline and tell us that it's there. So I have a patrol out on Boca Chica Beach actually this morning rescuing a turtle there because a member of the public was fishing off the jetties, saw a turtle stuck and in trouble and called us. Um, and we sent someone over there to rescue that turtle. It'll be rehabbed in our hospital before the end of the day. Wow. It's, I mean, I, I feel like you have to go home feeling like you did something good today. Yeah. Them. You know, this is an animal that, you know, but for intervention in issues like this morning would not have survived. Um, and, you know, we're, we're moving the needle and it's not hard things. It's actually easy things. Um, well, let's go back to that then, because before I get to the sort of conservation piece of right. it all, but, you know, there's this talk of this big, massive island of, of plastic, right, in the ocean. And I think as Americans, we're a little bit lucky because it's not our daily reality. But yeah. talk a little bit about the plastic problem and why that's really the thing that drives so much of this. Yeah, so uh, the better part of 50 percent of our patients come into our hospital because of some kind of human intervention. Um, and I say that because it could be that they ate something that wasn't food. They were impacted by a boat by a fisherman, uh, improper disposal of fishing equipment or lines or hooks. It's something to do with us, meaning the human element, interfering with something going on in the water. Um, and that absolutely involves uh, plastics and more a, a bigger issue being um, trash and trash disposal and proper trash disposal. Uh, you know, and we, we work on sending that message here in some really unique ways. If you come into our facility, kids especially will go through what we call a trash tunnel. Um, and what it is, is it's a remake of what sea turtles see in the ocean. Um, and what it looks like to them is food, uh, because why else would it be floating in the water? Right. What it in fact is, is trash. Um, and they eat it because this is their food source. And why would it be in their food source? But for that, um, we have a big display on single use plastics. Uh, and in the time it takes you to read, uh, the sign about single use plastics, there's been more than a thousand bottles, just, you, you know, so making little small incremental changes 
um, can have a pretty huge difference. And, you know, there's a, this is a big issue. You know, you talk to people, it gets very complicated with, you know, nurdles and whether recycling is actually happening the way it's supposed to. And what we, we talk about here is let's, let's focus on the low hanging fruit. I am personally going to be accountable for making sure that I eliminate plastic, single use plastic bottles from my life. And every time I'm blessed enough to be able to leave my home, in a day. I'm going to pick up five pieces of trash that day and put it where it belongs. I'll let the big story and all the big things and all the complexities of plastics and nurdles and recycling and what the Senate's doing and all that. I'll leave that to someone else. And I'm just going to focus on those two small changes I can make in my life. And if we get enough people to make those small changes, the impact is significant. I'm going to try that. So eliminating the single use, like the water bottles, and then just picking up stuff when I see it, that's going to be- just Pick uh, it up off the floor and put it where it goes. Yeah. Um, that's so easy. Mm-hmm. I don't know why we don't do it. Um, I do want to talk about the conservation piece because a big part of what's happening with these animals is we are living different places. We're, we're basically dehabitizing them. Um, we are, I'm wearing my Corpus Christi hook sweater. We are big nice. Corpus Christi people. My sister-in-law goes to so many releases when they hatch. How important is it to, again, figure out a way to, to coexist with these animals because – I think people misunderstand that all of this stuff is in a cycle for a reason and you mess up with one part of it and you throw the whole thing off. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a wheel and it's got to be round to go. Um, so, you know, one of the big we're actually gearing up for it now uh, is the beginning of nesting season, which will start at the beginning of April. Um, and on South Padre Island alone last year, there were over 100 nesting sea turtles and over 10,000 hatchlings released um, during the season last year. Uh, This is a big impact item. Uh, Nowhere else but along this Texas coast could you be sitting in the middle of the day having a beer with your family (laughs) on a beach vacation and a nesting sea turtle walk up, dig a hole and lay 100 eggs right next to you. Um, So that's a big responsibility, Um, you know, and we compound it in Texas because we can drive on the beach in Texas. Um, so now right. we we not only have to know that they nest there, we have to move them to a to a place that some were safe. Um, so we are at a breakneck pace uh, during nesting season. Uh, and you mentioned it, uh, public releases are a big part of that season for us uh, here on South Padre Island. So uh, for the months of June, July, and August, if you come down here for a week, chances are we're going to be able to let you see some baby turtles be released while you're here. Um, because that's what really sparks people understanding how truly defensive, defenseless these little babies are um, and how important it is to get them back out into the water. Well, the cool thing is, is we live in a world that's globally connected through the Internet. And in fact, Wendy, as we were having this interview, I made a $50 donation through PayPal to the organization. Talk about how people can help because we, we're really all in this together. Yeah, so I appreciate that. We are a nonprofit, so uh, we are funded in totality from good people wanting to do good things. Um, So uh, there is a lot of ways you can involve. Obviously, you can engage with us physically in this brick and mortar building uh, that we operate out of uh, and bring your family uh, and your um, friends to a beach vacation and visit us while you're here. Um, you can engage with us online on social media. Um, so after the great cold stun a couple of years ago where we had almost 6,000 sea turtles, globally, there's a lot, you know, we have a large reach uh, online. We share a lot of um, after the pandemic, we really wanted people to be able to be engaged with us without physically being present with us. And our online campaign and marketing strategy is focused around that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we like to be really easy to give money to. Um, so you can donate to us on, um, our website, on Facebook, on all social media platforms, um, or you can come in and see, see us live. Well, again, I encourage everybody to get there. We will have all the social media and all the websites in the description of this episode. She's Wendy Knight from Sea Turtle Incorporated or Sea Turtle Inc. How you doing? I mean, Wendy, thanks so much for jumping on. Let's get to, um, we will be back out, I think to Padre Island this year. So we will stop in and say hello. We look forward to seeing you. Ladies and gentlemen, please adjust your scorecards. We have a special guest in the lineup. And not only is Let's Get Two back early in this baseball season, but Paul Caputo is back from Baseball by Design and SportsLogos.net, part of the Curb Media Network, and 
our cultural attache, I guess. Paul, first of all, uh, how has your offseason been? I've been licking my wounds still, you know, it's uh, my Phillies went on this wild ride, this crazy, like barely hung on to get into the playoffs. And I was, I was going to be content with one win. I was, you know, that, that comeback win over the Cardinals and game one of the wild card round. And then they go on this crazy wild ride and I finally get super greedy. They make it to the world series. I go to world series game three, they win it seven, nothing, it's the, it's the high point of my my sports life since 2008 and I'm like they're going to win. They're going to win the World Series. They they can't be beat at Citizens Bank Park. And uh and then it's all black since then. I I can't remember <laughs> anything that happened after that. I assume they won the World Series and that the As the far Rockets, as you know. As far as I know they won the World Series. Exactly. Yeah. I'm still exactly. celebrating I, 2019, so it's fine. I, <laughs> I don't remember anything after game 3 of the World Series. Okay, so my my follow up question to you is <laughs> the Super Bowl. Yeah, I don't remember anything after halftime. <laughs> well, all right. Well, that's yeah. that wraps up. It wraps us up with Paul Caputo, everybody. Yeah, okay. it was the great. Phillies won the World Series, the Eagles won the Super Bowl, and it's been a great off season. Well, um, talk to me a little bit about World Baseball Classic. Like, how oh, interested yeah. are you going to be? Like, are you fired up for it? Um, I don't really know when this episode, when this interview is going to drop. It's either next week or the week after, so I don't know where we'll be. But what's your your excitement level? So I I like the World Baseball Classic a lot. I think it's good for baseball. I love the idea of baseball being played internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was watching at the time of this recording. It was this morning. I was watching Panama and Chinese Taipei. Last night I watched Cuba and the Netherlands, and uh, I love it. I love that. Minor League Baseball's own Tyler Mon is broadcasting these games uh, that are out there in in that pool. Watching the watching the international fans, watching games, watching this. You know, uh, Todd Radom talked about this because Todd Radom created the original branding for the World Baseball Classic. He and I talked about this on on my podcast, Baseball by Design. Uh, that you know, this very familiar thing of baseball taking place in unfamiliar settings is just really fascinating and fun. And I love seeing baseball happen in places that I'm not accustomed to seeing it. So uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I enjoy like researching things like why is Xander Bogarts playing for the Netherlands? Yeah. Because he's from Dutch Aruba, right? Like, I mean, it's, you know, I I love this sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I Dutch Aruba, is that right? Dutch Antilles. I think Dutch Antilles. Uh, regardless, you know, I think it's fun to see these players who have these connections to these places end up on these teams, seeing baseball played in other places. I love the uniforms. I think there's so much good branding yeah. in the World Baseball yeah. Classic. So I'm a huge fan, huge fan of the World Baseball One Classic. One of my favorites is has been Team Israel. I, first of all, yeah. love the look. And I mm-hmm. love that they're allowing you to play for them, even if you have the most tangential connection to either being <laughs> Jewish or, is, or being from Israel, because they're trying to right. get something built. And I kind of dig that. Right. Is this, is this like, you could be like a, like a Santos esque, like Jew ish. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I just found out I'm 1% Jewish on 23 and me. So I think I'm playing third next week. There I don't you know. Go. You go, go. They need some help on the corner infield, I guess. They, yeah. They, they just might, <laughs> but no, it's been neat. And I think the other thing that's cool to me, and I, I translate this also to like I've watched some Japanese games. I know you've watched mm-hmm. games in Asia as well mm-hmm. on TV. They fan the way I wished we fanned about baseball. Like to them, yeah. it's like watching a soccer game in Europe. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and it reminds me of you know the one international game, if you can call it international. I went to a Caribbean series game in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Okay. Understanding that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but culturally it, it felt foreign, you know, being at, at this game, Caribbean series game there. And it was very much what you're describing, right? Like it was fans on their feet, the whole game, there's people drumming, there's people dressed in costumes and, and interacting with the, with one another, even if they were rooting for different teams, they were r- interacting with one another in really funny ways. Uh, it just just a really engaging atmosphere to to watch this this international baseball in. So I, it's part of what I like seeing on TV as I'm watching the World Baseball Classic. Yeah, I'm, and I'm excited. And of course, obviously, I'm I'm pulling for Team USA. There's no Team mm-hmm. Poland this year. Um, <laughs> our own Scott McIntyre could have played for them, I guess. But um, <laughs> but let's turn our attention to you know 
are the thing that you and I are really passionate about, which is minor leagues with, uh, and I'm, I'm following up on one of your Twitter polls with a lowercase M meaning <laughs> everyone, you know, right. and it's, we, we've been through several rebranding seasons and we'll get into some specific rebrands like later on in the season. But my big question for you is you've been covering this a long time. How have you seen trends change in the way these brands are being developed? And do you like where it's going? The what I really like is the hyper local approach, right? Like that uh-huh. that we're we're seeing teams try to make a connection to something in their local community, and and play on that. The the one that we just saw most recently with the the counter clocks in Lexington. Yeah, I, I love that of, one. Yeah, they sort of took everyone by surprise by that. I didn't. I don't. I didn't know that that was coming. And I write about this for SportsLogos.net. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had we had to sort of dig to see which firm it was that had created that brand. So I think you're seeing some teams start to go away from maybe the 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 big firms. I mean, you know, Brandios. Dan Simon, they're still going to be the the major players sure, in, yeah. in rebranding. But every once in a while, you see a team like this that went with, you know, like the the counterclocks went with a a uh with a with a local firm and really played on something hyper local. The people who get into, you know, reading that story and seeing, like, oh yeah, like in Kentucky, we started racing our horses counterclockwise instead of clockwise to differentiate from the British, right? Like that there, there's a story there that's super cool, right? Um, so I really like the trend towards the hyper, hyper local that we've been seeing, you know, probably 15, 20 years, right? You know, what I mean, yeah. this 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 goes back to sort of the, I think the early days of of Dan Simon and Brandios, the the sort of major players. I think you now have w- what I worry about in minor league baseball is people who saw some of these wacky brands work now sure. just doing wacky for wacky sake. Right. And, okay. and it feels like there's sort of like, you know, like, like there's a certain contingent of, you know, kind of brandiose wannabes <laughs> out there in the design world right now. Um, and there's a lot of talented designers who are not, you know, as big as Brandios and Dan Simon, right? There's a lot of great design happening out there. I think there are some teams that are trying to just be wacky for wacky's sake, yeah. or they're creating connections to something so obscure within their local community that it is actually like hard to access in a way. And so, yeah. I, I I think this trend of the of the wacky nickname is good for baseball. I think the hyper local connection is good for baseball. I think there are some teams that have tried to sort of be imitators that haven't done a great job of it. And I think that's well, the danger gonna say, of the trend. Sometimes that imitation seems to be all right. What's a local food item? Are we've be- right. we now begun and ended our research? And I was re- I really was re- I felt refreshed by the whole counterclocks thing because. Uh-huh. Like you said, that's something completely different. No one has done that. Right. Um, and I was also reassured, I want you to take on this too, that I think the idea that baseball is staying in Lexington, because there was a whole debate yeah. about that with the sale. So at least it feels like there's gonna we're going to keep baseball in a spot of the country where there's been baseball for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think these creative, these creative connections are, uh, you know, like, so, so yes. Yeah, so Lexington now has two teams. Right. And uh, and when they lost their affiliated status, when the legends lost their affiliated status, there was questions, you know, like, hey, are we going to be able to have baseball here? The fact that they have baseball, that they've started this or they've transitioned in their independent lowercase minor league baseball uh, tenure to a different brand. I think that that's you know, there's value in that. I think that that's a new era for baseball in, in Lexington. I know that this this brand got beat up a little bit on social media, but I think people will come around to it. The visual aesthetic is a little bit different from some of the other, you know, brands that we've seen out there uh, in minor league baseball. I think you're going to see teams push the limits more. They're going to continue pushing the limits. The Hickory Crawdads introducing an alternate brand as the Hickory Dickory Docks, right? Like with a clock and a mouse running up it. Yeah. It's just fun, right? Like it's fun minor league baseball and I think it's I, I I think you know outside the sort of you know food based brands um, you know and, and some of these food based brands uh, you know the the 
the the cues was one that came out relatively recently. I think that's a great one. The Canapolis sure. Cannonballers. The Cannonballers don't miss. The Cannonballers just don't miss, right? No, I mean, and, no, they don't. And yeah. and it's funny you say that because I love the Hickory Dickory Dock things, the cues, but I wasn't I'm, I'm not loving the Amarillo calf fries. Like that to me felt like a five second idea. I think that was just dropped today. Like um yeah, that was that is definitely fresh hit as of today. Yeah. Um, Hartford yard goats and they're bouncing pickles, right? Like that is like, that is super obscure. You know, they went deep, deep into, you know, the, and it's not even, it's, it's a law. They, they, it's based on a law that is actually not a law. They say, oh, it's this obscure law that you can, you know, you can get thrown in jail if you sell pickles that don't bounce, which is absolutely not true. And they know it's not true, but it's a great idea for a brand, right? Like, so don't you kind of wish it was true though? Like, don't you kind of wish it was on the books? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's a story though i mean if you dig you can find the story where someone the the a guy was selling pickles and I, it was like late 1800s early 1900s he was selling pickles he said they were fresh and he got fined 500 dollars because he said i'll prove how fresh they are and he threw a pickle on the ground and it didn't bounce and so that's like <laughs> that's where this lore comes from and the hartford yard goats are now playing a game as the bouncing pickles i um i love it <laughs> One of the things I, w- I was curious about, just like these broad trends, because we're also getting into theme night season, right? So we're getting <laughs> into temporary looks based on themes. Um, are you get fired up for those too? Like, are you excited when you see every team Star Wars jersey, or are you starting to feel that's maybe wearing thin? I, for one, as you know, already pre spend money when I see that there's going to be a special <laughs> jersey. So, um, where are you on that? I so when it's something you know that I like, right? Like, I, you know, I. Yes, I like the Star Wars Knights. I think the Star Wars Knights are fun from sort of a fan experience perspective. Yeah. The the one of the reasons that they felt to me like they were running their course a little bit is that there were a lot of sort of templated brands out there. There were there were companies that offered like here's our R2D2 jersey and you can put your, you know, slap your logo on it. I think teams are getting away from that. I think they're starting to be a little bit more creative now with the Star Wars brands. What I think's um, interesting about that, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but No, no, no it's good. Star Wars is actually one of the brands that doesn't that, that, that incur has been encouraging these teams to be creative. Like they're yeah. not necessarily for like obviously Defenders of the Diamond, which is of course funny because they're both Disney is a whole other right. thing. Yeah. But Star Wars is, I think that one of the only few rules is is that you cannot spell your 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 team name in their font. That's about oh. that's really about it. All right. So yeah, and I yeah. do think so. I do get fired up for these. I love the I love the sort of anniver- the movie anniversary themes. I, I want a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. What night was so I need some team to do a hitchhiker's guide night for me. And I will fly there for that game. Paul, I have 20 more interviews of teams. I'm going to suggest a hitchhiker guide to every <laughs> single one of them. I'm going to put it in the rapid fire. We're going to make that happen for you, buddy. Holy smokes. It'll be a while because now the, the timeline for introducing, for designing these and getting approval on these is longer than it used to be, as you know, from talking yeah. to these teams. Yeah. So it'll be, you know, 2025. But if, if some team says that's a great idea, it'll be 2025 before we see it at this point. Well, when Ed watches this, that our good friend Ed Rivera watches this show, he's going to roll his eyes because I was pushing hard for Jaws night and that didn't happen <laughs> in Columbia. So um, I don't know how effective I, I am at that. But, you know, Talk a little bit about that again. Like, I love that we're getting to have a broad strokes overview conversation about this because it's fun mm-hmm. to get nitty gritty. But I like seeing your your opinions on these things because you do such a good job of covering them. Um, the amount of time it takes to approve. Do you feel like down the road is that going to become a hindrance? I was thinking about the major league level where Nike now says you can only have four jerseys plus their city connect thing. Right? Can you see a? a, a an area where it becomes too too cumbersome for teams to get some of these approved things going. I think we're we're hopefully getting past that point right now. Coming out of the sort of the major league baseball takeover of minor league baseball, getting out of COVID and getting into this new routine, I think that you're starting now to see the the temporary brands that are that you know took a long time to get approval Teams, I think, now have anticipated this. They understand what's involved, and we're going to get back now into a rotation. We hardly saw any alternative brands last season. Sure, The ones that we did see were mostly holdovers that had been approved and were going to happen during the COVID year and then didn't and then got pushed back. So now we're at a position where these teams, you know, after, after Major League Baseball got involved with minor league baseball and they implemented these new rules – I think we're going to see less logo Vember 
And we're going to start seeing a lot more in like March and April uh, okay. that get announced for the following season. So I, I think hopefully we're we're beyond that. It's going to be less during the off season, and it's going to be more right at the beginning of the season that we see, uh, you know, alternate marks coming for the for the coming season. But I I think we're 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 through that sort of part of the the plan where they threw sand in the gears, and now we're we're beyond that, and now we're going to start seeing it on a sort of regular rotation again. And if I'm being um, sort of generous, part of that might means we might even start seeing or continue to see a higher quality of the design as opposed to whatever the team wanted to do, they could throw on a shirt and now we're moving out. I I think that there's, you know, major league baseball will hold minor league teams to a certain standard. Um, and yeah, I, I think, I think you'll see, you know, I, it'll be like the facilities, right? Like it'll be, yeah. you know, now there's 120 teams and they are required to have a certain level of facility uh, per major league baseball's requirements. My only concern there is that Major League Baseball doesn't restrict the fun that these teams want to have, right? Like, and I know they say they're not going to, and the rebrands so far have been, you know, okay. Uh, the the Space Cowboys one was was handled really well, right? Like, I think that that's a terrific rebrand, and that was one of the first ones we saw under Major League Baseball. Right, good point. So I I hope that they allow teams to have fun even in the name of like sort of a higher quality of, you know, design and and standards that they're holding these teams to. Well, and I guess my, my last, my, my sort of argument in favor of that too, was they didn't acquire these teams to not make money. And these, these things do make money. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to leave you with it, with a let's get to programming question that I, I'm curious <laughs> to get your answer to that. I want to hear about your trips before we get out of here. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to the Syracuse Mets this year. Do I cover them? You know, we, cause we've, you've, we've talked internally about, we've not really done that whole team parent team thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, just should we, should we do it anyway? What do you think? I would cover their alternate brands. The Syracuse Mets have some terrific alternate brands. I think you could mention like, oh yeah, their name for their parent club. Uh, but they do, they do so much fun stuff as, uh-huh. as alternate that I think that that's where the the story is. Like, you know, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Um, I, you know, I, I would be less interested when, when our friend Pat Larson does his minor league baseball hat history series. And it's like, Hey, look at, I'm doing the, uh, the Mississippi Braves, right? I'm just like, hey, I love you, Pat, but I'm going to give this Pat, one. And I'm going to retweet you because you're one of the <laughs> nicest guys doing this, but oh boy. All right. I, I'll watch this because I love you, but not because I love the Mississippi Braves. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, speaking of which, I know that you and I are going to get to see each other um, yeah. in May, but what are some other trips you got you have planned this year? Do you have, have you started, because I know you do a big one, mm-hmm. baseball mm-hmm. palooza thing. Do you have those pinned down yet? Baseball palooza is going to be in the Pacific Northwest, August 24 to 27. And we're going to see the uh, Hillsborough Hops, the Tacoma Rainiers, the Vancouver Canadians. And I am pushing hard to get out to Eric Merton's uh, Tri-City Dust Devils. There's there's some dissent in the group. We may end up at a Mariners game instead of the Dust Devils for ease of driving. I know, okay, I know, okay, I know. Okay. Um, so that's Baseball Palooza this year. The very first game that I will get to will be uh, I'm going to be at opening day for the Arkansas Travelers as part of a work trip. So uh, that's one that I I know about already. That'll be fun. I have plans to see. Let's get this. I have plans to see a Savannah Bananas banana ball game in Birmingham, Alabama with Dan Simon himself and Anna DiTomaso. So Anna and Dan and I are going to a Savannah Bananas game in Birmingham in June. And I think Donnie Wise, our mutual friend, will also be there. So y'all can do a big we'll, we'll do banana a banana split. Up. I don't know. <laughs> and Dan and I will also be at a Rocket City Trash Pandas game uh, the the day before. I uh, It's June 23 and 24 when we're seeing these two games. And, um, and I'm going to be with the NASA engineer who was on my podcast talking about what it would take to get a uh, a raccoon and a trash can into <laughs> outer space. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we've got our... Uh, We've got our Trash Panda episode coming up in um, April, and we're having an engineer talking about why we need to care about space, and we're going to talk to someone from Space Camp, and I'm hoping it's Tate Donovan. Oh, that would be something. (laughs) Am I the only one who remembers that movie? I'd get Leah Thompson, but I met her once, and I couldn't speak to her in person. I don't know if I can speak to her her now. All right, Paul. Muster your courage. 
I, I know it was <laughs> look, that's just it's a conversation best over for a beer, but let's just say one of my actors said, Hey, do you know Leah? And she's and I'm like, Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> um, so does 17 year old me. All right, Paul Caputo, baseball by design and sportslogos.net and part of Curb Curb and Media. Paul, first of all, thanks for jumping on and thanks again for signing up for another season with Let's Get Two. I am I'm looking forward to the the new look. Let's get to love the new logo and love the new look. James Christopher here all slimmed down and ready for, for, in his fight and wait for the season. Yeah, I will tell you, you got to go play for Team Israel. All right, we will <laughs> we will talk to you soon. Make sure everybody's following him and following your shows. We'll have links to all that stuff in the description of this show. Raiders of the Lost Diamond, digging into baseball's past. It's going to be a good segment. Trust me. Does the hat even work? I can, I can honestly never tell. So on this week's Raiders of the Lost Diamond, we're going to take a drive south from Daytona Beach, right down Interstate 4 to the land of celery, Sanford, Florida. The Celery City's first professional baseball team were the appropriately named Sanford Celery Feds. The Celery Feds were managed by Ed Chaplin to a first place finish with a 46 and 30 record. And the offense was led by former Cardinal, future Pirate, and future Senator Stuffy Stewart. We need more ball players with the nickname Stuffy. That's Manfred, that's your solution to fix baseball. The Celery Feds won a playoff series against the Orlando Caps five games to three but two of their wins were later thrown out for roster rule violations and the series was declared a draw. I thought there wasn't any ties in baseball because it's like kissing your sister. I also thought cheating was invented in 2017 in the city of Houston, so I'm really all kinds of uneducated this segment. The 1920 team lacked the relative star power of the 1919 crew and their fortunes dropped precipitously. A new skipper helmed the celery feds to a disappointing 40 and 63 record Good for only seventh place in the A-team circuit. I actually would like to know who number eight was. Now, following 1920, baseball went to seed in Sanford until 1925, when a new Celery Feds team cropped up. Sanford's new team picked up where the last one left off, unfortunately, harvesting only 36 wins and 86 losses. Good for 46th and last place in the FSL. Celery Feds pitcher Mike Kelly would get a cup of coffee with the Phillies the following season, but that's about it. Now, minor league baseball would continue off and on with such teams as the Lookouts, the Seminoles, the Giants, the Cardinals, and the Greyhounds from 1936 to 1960, including a brief revival of the Celery Feds in 1946. Nowadays, baseball's back in Sanford in the form of the River Rats of the Florida Collegiate Summer League, a team that would start their history strong by winning the championship in the league's inaugural season. And now, on to close it out, the right-hander from Houston, Texas, James Christopher. So that does wrap up this episode of Let's Get To. Thanks to the Tortugas. Thanks to the Rescue for joining us. Uh, it, it meant a lot to us to get to talk to you guys. Now, next week, we've got a special Let's Get To episode because we are going live with Eric Mertens and Andy Tom Chesson. This season, we're going to be doing periodic live episodes. We hope to see you March 28th at 7 Central. And until then, as baseball season gets closer, get your peanuts, get your Cracker Jack, and remember, as always, let's get to. Let's Get To is presented by Twitchy Dolphin Media. Creative directors, Jessica Bybee Jedgetts. Executive producers, James Christopher, Andy Tumchesson, and Scott McIntyre. Produced by Andrew Nelson and Eric Mertens. Associate producers Timothy Jedgetts and Jess Canaster. All content created by Let's Get To is the sole property of Twitchy Dolphin Media. All content created by teams covered in the episode are the sole property of the trademark holders. 